Good morning. And happy Sabbath. It's so nice to have church full again, uh, or full under COVID circumstances. So thank you for being here early on a Sabbath morning and for our first Sabbath school back uh, since we went into this lockdown period. So a very warm welcome to our regular members, to our visitors. It's so nice to have you here. To those watching online, happy Sabbath, and we are blessed that you chose our channel to tune into. So for those of you who remember a few weeks or months ago, the Sabbath School team had started on a series called A Sermon by the Master, and that's obviously focusing on the Beatitudes, which, we, which we'll go through week by week. So the last one Rania um, presented on, and that was Blessed Are the Poor in Spirit. So today we'll be looking at Matthew 5, verse 5, which is um, Blessed Are the Meek. So as um, we were preparing, uh, you might have noticed it's a father and daughter endeavor today. So um, I started to think, you know, we use this term meek, and what does it actually mean? So looking at what is meekness, I just went to the dictionary, and Merriam-Webster says what it is. So synonyms would be down to earth, humble, modest, unassuming, and pretentious. You know, in other words, not... Um, having or showing any feelings of superiority, self-assertiveness, or showiness. On the opposite hand, what it is not is impatient, superior, aggressive, egotistic, vain, proud, boastful, you know, all the qualities that society today upholds, um, which is really sad, and it's everything that's focused on self, in other words. So I also just looked at the etymology and where this word comes from, and it's from the Greek prize, which means strength under control. So in ancient Greece, war horses were trained to be meek, and while they were strong and powerful under submission, they would um, control and be willing to submit if they were trained correctly. So um, there was just a quote here I found from someone online that said, a meek person doesn't shy away from taking a stand. Rather, the stand is taken at the right time with the right people in the right way. He or she submits or constrains power for a greater effect on self and on others. So um, I hope you can share this antidote with a few other people. Um, and then just before I hand over, meekness is essentially being having a humble attitude um, that expresses itself in the patient endurance of offense. Meekness is not weakness, it is power under control. And a uh, text that encapsulates this is Proverbs 16 verse 32 that says, one who is slow to anger is better than the mighty, one who rules his spirit than he who takes a city. And if we think about this, this is essentially the character of Jesus, is it not? Um, if we look at 1 Peter 2, verse 23, it says, He did not retaliate when he was insulted, nor threaten revenge when he suffered. He left his case in the hands of God, who always judges fairly. So um, may we strive to be meek, and I'll now hand over to Brian from our personal ministries and evangelism department. So we're going to try and get each different department within our church to come up and present at some time. And, they'll be, and uh, today we're getting a sermon called Happy Are You. Well, not a sermon, but a Sabbath school. <laughs> Happy Are You. Thank you, Shanda. And um, I heard that, Daryl. This is not a sermon. <laughs> this is not a sermon. But um, God bless you as uh, you no doubt came to church expecting a great, great blessing. And the Beatitudes is all about that. Um, good to see you, Gary. It's uh, your father's house and there's so many people that I haven't seen in a long time. It feels like forever, Chrissy. But uh, it's a special blessing to be here with the Sabbath School Department. And uh, as Shanda has already said, I'm representing the uh, Personal Ministry Department, which is really part and parcel of all the elders together. We don't have a separate individual responsible for personal ministries. But um, when I was asked by Chantel, um, I gladly said yes, I'd be happy to um, make a contribution to the theme, which is the Beatitudes. So I know Shanda has prayed already, but I'd like to just have a short prayer before we begin. Father, the time has come for your word to be lifted up. And we realize Jesus is the word. He is 
the way, the truth, and the life. And we want to say to you this morning, please may you minister to each one of us through your spirit and speak to our hearts these wonderful words of life. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. All right, so let me just get this uh, slideshow on. Hopefully it's going to work here. All right, there you go. Happy are you. Are you happy to be in the house of the Lord today? I sure am. Uh, let your face know it though. Uh, it's hard to see the smiles behind the mask though. Thank you, Daryl. <laughs> and, and I trust uh, our, our viewers, wherever you are at home or wherever you might be, that you are happy today because it is the Sabbath of the Lord. So, so as Shanda said in a talk, if you're listening carefully, the Greek word for blessed is makarios, which means happy or happy year. So, you know, sometimes we, we look at things that are material, things that are temporal and transient. It might be you wanting to get an education and getting your degree, PhD. It might be that you want to start a business and this is your specific business. It might be on to start a career. It might be on to have a family and you just plan out your family. This is the way you want it to be. I'd like to have a son and a daughter. My daughter Carrie is having a little girl in November. We're hoping to go there in spite of the coronavirus. So she's having a twin, not a twin, but um, what do you call it? A pigeon pair. Thank you, Lil. A pigeon pair. Now, many, many couples just like say, I wish I could just have that. Some will want to have a son first and a daughter or a daughter and a son, whatever it is. But, you know, whatever it is, whether it be raising a family, your career, or anything else, when you achieve that, you think, well, you know what? I have arrived. I can tell you of situations in my life where I had business plans and goals and objectives. And when I got to them, Carl, I found out, man, it's not such a big deal. It's not as exciting as I thought it would be. And soon after, it just wanes away. And you're looking for something else to replace that. Well, when you come to the Beatitudes, Makarios means happy year. In other words, whatever is the happiest moment you can have in this life, when it comes to the spiritual blessings, it is the most happiest thing that can happen to you. Happy year are you. So we've looked at the first two Beatitudes, but we're going to look at the third one today. Blessed are or happy are the meek. Why are the meek going to be happy? Before I put the text up, can someone finish it off? Blessed are the meek for they shall inherit the earth. Now, not this earth. Although God can bless us, he says, if you will trust me and obey, you will be the head and not the tail. So, so we can have wonderful, victorious experiences in this life. But friends, this is talking about the earth made new. It's talking about the kingdom of God. Blessed the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. I don't want to inherit this earth and then die of some lifestyle disease or in a tragic accident or anything else. I don't inherit this earth with all its sickness and sorrow and pain and suffering. You know, uh, it was Queen Elizabeth, when she came to a deathbed, she said, one, my, all my riches for one moment of time. She knew that her life had come to an end and her riches meant nothing. If she could just have some time, if she can just have the joy that uh, only God can give. So, happy are you. So, um, Bible and I went to... Um, the Sea of Galilee, a couple of years ago, three years already with Pastor Francois and a group. And um, we went to the Mount of Beatitudes. Now, there's the um, little plaque there or board that uh, says, okay, this is probably, we don't know for sure, of course. But they say, this is more than likely the spot where Jesus gave this discourse of Matthew chapter 5, 6 and 7. So as we walk down to what Franz, Pastor Francois said, probably would have been the place because it's got a little bit of like a feel of um what do you call it dell when you're out there and you've got this like arena where the sound comes back the acoustics is good amphitheater thank you so it's got like 
it seems to be like an amphitheater. So here it is here. It looks like this here. There's, a, there's memorials all over and plaques of this and plaques of that. And so certain churches have taken this spot. It's usually either the Greek Orthodox Church or the Roman Catholic Church. They've got all these sites here. I mean, there's a beautiful church there. This is a picture from the Sea of Galilee. And that's what the shoreline looks like. Beautiful. It's a very fertile ground. They grow lots of fruit there. Citrus, banana plantations all over the show there. It's absolutely serene. And as I was thinking about this year, wow. You know, I was trying to imagine, because Ellen White says as she starts the book, Thoughts on the Mount of Blessings, where she, she expounds on the Beatitudes. She says, imagine and try and grasp the scene, what it was like when Jesus was there with this huge crowd. A multitude had gathered there. I mean, he had been healing the sick. Capernaum is just below, by the way, just in the dip there. Um, and that was the town of Jesus. It became his town after, of course, Nazareth rejected him. And, of course, his disciples, uh, Peter and his family were there. And Bethsaida was just next door to that as well. Beautiful, beautiful lake. So as you look at, as, as, I, as I took these pictures and I imagined what it must have been like for Jesus, it was serene for me. Uh, the Sea of Galilee can be boisterous and very violent. But when we were there, you can see the water just beautiful and calm. And that's like just before the sun set. Isn't that gorgeous? Beautiful. But here is Jesus with this crowd of people. They had gathered by the lake side. And there was an air of expectancy. They, they, they wanted to hear something from this itinerant preacher that was going all over Judea and gathering followers. Many people were flocking to this new teacher. He spoke words like no other did before. And as they came to Jesus, you know what? The thoughts and the theology that they had was, when Messiah comes, we will inherit the earth, terra firma. We will have this country back to ourselves. We will have that glorious reign as it was in the time of David and Solomon. The Romans will be dispelled and removed and we will be the head and not the tail. So this was the expectancy they had. There was huge crowds that had gathered from all over, not just from Judea. Some had come as far as from Tyre and Phoenicia. There were heathens there that had heard about this great healer, Jesus Christ. They had come from all over. People were there from Jerusalem. Dignitaries and priests and scribes and Pharisees were there. They wanted to find out, could this be the man that we've been waiting for? Will he be the one? And then Jesus, notice what it says here in Matthew 5 verse 1, and seeing the multitudes, it says here, he went up into the mountain. So we, we're going up to the mountain now where he was set. Great teachers in that time, the culture was you would sit down and not stand like I am here when you are speaking to people. So Jesus would sit down and of course the crowds would sit down and they would listen to him. He was now here to speak to them the words that they expected to hear. And so when he was set, his disciples came unto him. And then here Jesus begins to speak these words. They are the most beautiful words. The Mount of the Beatitudes. It's the most beautiful discourse ever given by Jesus. And so when he started with, blessed are the poor in spirit, man, they thought, what on earth is that? The theology was, blessed are the rich, for they shall be happy. <laughs> Jesus said, blessed. They didn't understand Jesus was talking about that which is spiritual. The most treasured possession that we can have. That gift that money can never ever buy. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Why? Because they shall receive the blessing of the Lord. And when he kept, blessed are the more, those that mourn. For they shall be comforted, mourn. They didn't want to be in this condition. They wanted the temporal rule and reign of Palestine. So when Jesus gets to Matthew 5 verse 5, Blessed are the meek. What? Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those that mourn. Now we must be meek. What did Jesus say? What did he mean by blessed are the meek? Well, he told them right there. 
they shall inherit the earth. And as you look at the countryside, isn't that beautiful? Uh, if you could see further, you would look across the sea and you'd see Tiberius, where we spent the night. Beautiful, beautiful surroundings, even today. Absolutely gorgeous, but it must have been so much more beautiful in the time of Jesus Christ. The birds were chirping. The trees looked so extra beautiful. The air was filled with probably springtime. You know, I love springtime. Don't you just love springtime? This morning when I went out for my little prayer and devotion, I, I like to walk on the estate. And I came across um, a, an elderly lady. She's in her 70s. Um, and I said, isn't this a beautiful morning? She says, yes. And then I just felt I should tell her about the grace of God. And she said, oh, I love spring. I said, I also love spring. Isn't it beautiful to see everything resurrected? All the trees beginning to get their leaves. I said, it reminds me of Jesus. When he had paid the price for the sins of the world, he died for the sins and was resurrected to bring life. Isn't it wonderful to see all the life, all the ad wonderful, beautiful, variant, different um, plants, the flowers. And, and, and so... She, she appreciated that, and, and so she said, well, you know, and we carried on speaking. She told me a little bit about, about our situation from Kawi's Hill, etc., etc. But uh, here is Jesus talking about a new dimension, a paradigm shift from what they were thinking. The earth, just saying, I want to give you something much better than that. I want to give you the earth made new with no sin where you will be with me. And so clearly here, Jesus is talking about the earth made new. Listen to these beautiful words. Uh, although it was something strange and new, the people were spellbound and said, man, maybe there's something more to this man uh, from Galilee. Maybe he's got something more to say. The sweet divine love that flowed from Jesus began to touch their hearts. And there were those that were there from Judea, from Jerusalem, and from the different parts around Palestine. Gentiles were there. Israel was there. And they began to hear something beautiful. Notice what Ellen White says here about the Beatitudes. Throughout the Beatitudes, there is an advancing line of Christian experience. And as our Sabbath school will go through them, you'll see that one builds onto another, onto another. It's like Jacob's ladder. It's like Peter's ladder. You know, Peter starts with, you know, divine uh, uh, privilege that God has given to his people. And he says, add onto your faith, virtue. Add unto your virtue, brotherly kindness. So, so the same thing here with the Beatitudes. Uh, this is an advancing line of the Christian experience. So in other words, beloved family, we need to have all the attributes of the Beatitudes. Then we will be beautiful people on earth. Those who have felt the need of Christ, those who have mourned because of sin, right? Blessed the poor, need of Christ, because, you know, He is the pearl of great price. Blessed those who are mourn, mourning over their sinful situation. Uh, you know, the Bible says, rend not your garments, but rend your heart. Bring your hearts to Jesus. He wants to give you a new heart. We're going to look at one of my favorite texts just now in, 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 in all of the Old Testament. Because it says here, those who have mourned because of sin have sat with Christ in the school of what? Affliction. Do you like affliction? I personally don't like affliction. But it is the school where we learn more to trust and depend on Christ fully and not in our own wits, not in our own intelligence, not in our own talents, not in our own gifts, but to trust in Jesus here. So it says here, Christ, we must learn, we must sit with Christ in the school of affliction uh, and will learn meekness from the divine teacher. Now, the Bible says in the Old Testament that Moses was the meekest man that ever lived. But I'd like to say Jesus was the meekest man. Of course, he was the son of man um, that ever lived. Of course, Jesus was both human and divine. So it would be correct to say uh, Moses was the meekest man that ever lived because when you think about the life of Moses from the palace he goes where? Into the wilderness 
and then he becomes a leader to take people out of Egypt. When you think about Joseph, he went also from the favored son to the prison and then to the palace. So God leads us in the school of affliction so that we can understand more what his will is for us. Jesus places meekness, listen to this here, among the first of the qualifications for the kingdom. So it's not the first beatitude, but Ellen White says Jesus places this one, meekness, as the first qualification. Why do you think that would be? Because the Bible says pride goes before a what? A fall. Satan fell from heaven because of pride. And friends, meekness is exactly the opposite from pride. But you say, Brian, how can that be so? We are born inherently with a what? A proud nature because we are carnal. We are fallen. How do we obtain this meekness? And I'm, I'm praying in the next five minutes uh, and a bit we can be able to wrap this up here. It says, in his own life and character, the divine beauty of this precious grace is revealed. So it's not something I can produce, Carl. Pumi, I've got to look for this meekness outside of myself because it's impossible for me or for you to develop this meekness by your merit or by your strengths. It is only found in Christ. And we look at another beautiful text, the New Testament about the life of Christ. It says here, in his own life and character, the divine beauty of this precious grace is revealed. Patience and gentleness under wrong were not characterized by the Jews. They wanted revenge. They wanted to take care of business. And that's why Barabbas was such a popular leader. And he could sway the multitudes and people would choose Barabbas rather than Jesus. The word Barabbas by me means son of a father. So Jesus is the son of the father, but the devil presented his substitute. Listen, if you choose me, I am an expert in warfare. I'm able to get down and take care of business here. But notice here, it is only found in Jesus. It says here, Jesus places meekness first among the qualifications for his kingdom. In his own life and character, the divine beauty of the precious grace is revealed. I wanted to repeat that there. So that it was my emphasis. And that's what I'd like you to take. That Jesus should be the center of our joy. If you want real happiness, it's only found in Jesus. If you want true fulfillment in this life, and more importantly, in the life to come, it's only found in Jesus. Everything in this world is temporal. Trust me. I never ever thought when I was living in Zimbabwe many years ago, that that beautiful country with all its resources and everything going for it, the breadbasket of Africa, would one day just crumble and fall and become so inflated and people would leave, almost a third of the nation would leave looking for better prospects in countries all over the world. You can go to any place in the world. I promise you, you will find a Zimbabwe in there. You can go to St. Helena Island. They're there, lots of them. You can go to Mongolia, you'll find them there. People are looking for happiness in the wrong places. And so, friends, the answer is only found in Christ. Notice what Ellen White says. Jesus, the brightness of the Father's glory, thought it not a thing to be grasped, to be on an equality with God, but emptied himself taking what? Form of a servant. Isn't that amazing? I can never grasp that concept. That the Creator, the Father, and the Son who are ruling co-eternally on equality, that one of them, the son, Jesus, would step down from that position and say, I'll become less than an angel. I'll become less than man. I'll become the meekest of all men. I'll be born in a poor home to a carpenter and his wife, Mary. And I would live the lowliest life to show that I, who with my divine hand, can grasp the promise of eternal life from heaven. And offer it to you who are bound and shackled in sin. But friends, it says he emptied himself, taking the form of a servant. And so Paul says to you and me, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. How can I receive 
this mind that is meek, how am I going to be able to meet this qualification, which is the greatest of all? Notice here about Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal to God. In other words, he did not consider it that he is robbing himself of his high and lofty position in heaven, the command of the angels to come to this earth because he had a great mission to redeem those who had been lost and being found and uh, in the appearance as a man, he what? Humbled himself. That's meekness. He humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. So friends, Jesus is our great example. And he wants to give us that meekness, that which you and I cannot do for ourselves. There was in his manner, Ellen White says, no taint of bigotry. What is bigotry? Bigotry is self-righteousness. Bigotry is like, you know, we, we've got the truth. We are seven Adventists. We have the spirit of prophecy. We can tell you the oracles of Daniel and Revelation. You know, we come, become so proud about our heritage and our religion as the Pharisees were that we look down on other religions and other people. That's bigotry. We want to put our position as most important and anything else is of no consequence. The world's redeemer had a greater than angelic nature, yet united with his divine majesty were what? Meekness and humility. You see the interchangeability between humility and meekness? They really mean the same thing. That attracted all to himself. So people that were there, the Pharisees, most of them did not. There were a few like Nicodemus that later on recognized him, but most of them didn't want that because they loved the high seats. They love to be greeted in the marketplace, doctor, doctor, doctor. That's rabbi. Today, sometimes there are preachers that come up here that got PhDs. They want to be known. Hey, listen, I'm a doctor. That said, I've been on the pulpit with one such person before. He wanted to be introduced as a doctor. And if you called him brother, hmm, that was not acceptable to him. <laughs> Notice what he says here. Jesus emptied himself in all that he did, self did not appear. Can I say it of myself? Can you say it of yourself? Left to my own impossible. He subordinated all things to what? The will of his Father. Notice what John says. If you had known me, Jesus is speaking here, you would have known my Father also, and from now on you know him and have seen him. Jesus was the embodiment of humility and meekness. Jesus is the quintessential, that is the most perfect example of what humility is. And if we will spend time with him, we will come to know. Notice what he says here, and as a wrap up. As, and he bids us learn of me. Where is that text found from? Matthew eleven twenty nine. 29, right? Learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart. If any man will come after me, let him what? Deny himself. But he, Ellen White says, who learns of Christ is emptied of what? Self, pride, and love of supremacy. And there is silence in the soul. Self is yielded to the disposal of the Holy Spirit. And you know what the Holy Spirit does in us? Very quickly. Jeremiah says the heart is what? Deceitful above what? All things. And it's what? Desperately wicked. That's the carnal heart before Christ changes it. That's how Peter was before he was changed. But notice what God says. Who can know it? And then the answer comes in the same uh, passage. I, the Lord, search the heart. I rest the mind. I test the mind. Even to what? To give everyone according to his ways, according to the fruit of his doings. He says, I will give you, Brian. I'll give you, Edna. Hello? No problem. You, you're battling with selfishness? I'll take care of that. Give me your heart. And that's why Solomon, one of his proverbs says, Son, give me your heart. God's saying, if you will surrender your life, that's basically what he's saying. If you will put all your plans aside and accept my will for you, then you're going to experience what is true happiness. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit. Why? Why? Because here's a beautiful promise. God says, I will take out the stony heart that is within you. I will put within your heart a heart of flesh. 
I will put my spirit within your heart and cause you. God will empower you and me to what? To walk in my statutes and you will keep my judgments and do them. And so, as I close on this text, here is the promise, but it's an invitation. Come. Jesus is pleading to you and me. In the book of Revelation, chapter 3, verse 20, the last passage of the last of the seven churches, he says, let him who opens the door, I behold, I stand at the door and knock. Let him who opens the door, allow me to come in and I will what? I will sup with you. So God is inviting you and me. Whatever your struggles are, you're struggling with situation in your life, no job. You're struggling in a marital situation. You're struggling with a health condition. You're struggling with depression. You're struggling with some vice. The invitation is come. And, and friends, that's the last invitation in the last book in Revelation chapter 17 and the last was the chapter. The spirit and the bride say, come and let him who is a thirst come. And let him who comes also say, come. So your true happiness, my true happiness is when I come to the Lord and I invite others to come to the Lord. I can promise you that has been without a shadow of a doubt the best experiences I have ever had in my life. And there have been many of them. Where I've invited someone to come and they came and I saw the joy of the Lord in their life as a result of me inviting them to come. But friends, remember, it's the Holy Spirit that does the conversion. He convicts, He converts, He renews, and He blesses. Let us pray. Father, this morning, our hearts are warmed with a sense of joy and gladness. Makarios, blessed, are the meek for they shall inherit the earth. Oh Lord, thank you for this wonderful promise. Help us to take it into our hearts and to empty and be willing to be emptied of self. Lord, I can't empty myself. No one can do that. It's the Holy Spirit's sweet presence and influence that takes away all the pride, all the selfishness, all the covetousness, all the impurities. He's the one only that can bring about new creation. A springtime. And bring about a harvest. That we will also bear the fruit of the Spirit. I pray. Bless each one here in the sanctuary. Bless those at home. May we come to Jesus because unless we come, we can never experience the joy of his salvation we will not know what is meekness if we don't sit at the feet of jesus may that be something we do every day and as we do so may you change us from glory to glory even by your spirit in jesus name we pray amen